Um, I'll go next. Uh, if, again, if anyone else wants to uh, speak up, just let me know. I'll put you on the list. Uh, I don't have anyone after me. <coughs> that's why I'm going now. Um, okay. Um, we have had... Uh, I wanted to address the issue of peak oil uh, in particular. Um, just think about the fact that uh, we, we function on, on supply and demand. Um, it was back in the Bush year, I don't remember the particular year, where Exxon broke the record for profitability for a single year, Exxon Mobil. And we've had, I've had discussions about peak oil with quite a few people, and it tends to be an argument about whether we've gotten there or not, which, as you were able to point out, that's not really the issue, right? We're going to know that we've gotten there because all it is, is it's a, it's a statistical record, right? And then from that point on, it'll go down. But what it really signifies is that that's going to be when things will turn from being theoretical to being violent, right? So we're going to have the situation. Another thing to think about is that these are things that were planned out long before. Uh, the first, uh, what Paul uh, O'Neill, the first uh, Secretary of the Treasury in the Bush administration, his first, his first term, he said the very first meeting of the principals, they discussed the war in Iraq. This is day one. This is the first time everyone was sat down around the table. They discussed a war in Iraq. This has been on the table for a long time. The reason why is because it's part of a long-term strategic plan. Iraq is, has the, 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 the second largest proven reserves on the planet, right? Because they were in, in, in unstable and they were an opponent to us rather than being in our pocket like Saudi Arabia is, that's why that war happened. It had nothing to do with with September 11th. So this is a strategic plan. It's also a strategic plan that we don't develop alternatives to oil. Because if you're going to maximize profit, you want to maximize demand. And if you create alternatives to the demand, you'll take money out of these people's pockets. So what I want to point out is that, uh, I, to me, it's really important that we start conceptualizing a peaceful alternative. And the most important thing we can do is plug out. I, I'm really impressed uh, by what the uh, farmers and builders are doing, and in in that uh, you know justice dialogue, he came and he gave he made his case to us, and he made it clear that what he's doing is building a real alternative and not playing the games, which is really a rat race that they want us to get into. I, I see the, the the Occupy movement as an attempt to get people to see that the system is designed not to work for us. While we're doing that, we have to also point them in the direction of solutions, right? So for us, I think the most important thing is to do things, is to start making steps to get create alternatives. The alternatives given to us are almost never real alternatives, right? So peak oil is a really important thing. Um, it's, uh, it's something that should indicate to us that we have to start developing practical alternatives. How do we have energy for ourselves? Like that's just a practical question we have to be able to answer for ourselves. Um, yeah, so, something you were touching on earlier, uh, uh, the, the messaging of like the current you know, for-profit short-term structure and the difficulties in butting heads against that in, in terms of you know, the condition response to Oh yeah, no, they're doing the right thing. That's what that's what we're all doing here. Um, but I mean, being able to uh, you know address the sustainability aspect and, and really tie it into you know the reason why you know you had Occupy Wall Street get started. You know, the financial collapse, the unsustainability of our economic system, and tying that into the unsustainability of our of our demand for oil, uh, of the way that we're producing food, and, and just bringing that message that look. You know, you saw what happened when, you know, Wall Street collapsed. What happens when, you know, our ability to get oil collapses? What happens when our ability to get food and then water collapses? And, and saying, you know, do you really want to sit through, you know, what we just sat through the past five years again? But for, you know, life essential things. I mean, Wall Street, you know, it was drastically affected people's lives. But, you know, food, water, just basic, basic heating. I mean, that, I, I think that resonates with I don't have anyone else down after Eric. Well, I want to thank you for coming out. If you have not, I give you an opportunity. Actually, if you have some closing thoughts, uh, 
I, I won't respond to all of them, but they're all really awesome. But uh, just to what you'd said, I taught a class at Geneseo this semester. It's called Time for Outrage. Um, and it's based on the, just the title was borrowed from the book by uh, Hessel. It's a very short book that was released in France and was about, you know, uh, that this is time, this is time for outrage. And that is the uh, response that I think is appropriate. I think despair, I mean, I think we should be sad and we should cope. Like, we have to have coping mechanisms for these horrible things that are going on. Like, don't deny it and think we can just fix these problems. They aren't fixable. Uh, we have to navigate our way through this horrible situation. But outrage, which is what Wall Street's all about, uh, Occupy Wall Street's all about, is a positive response. It says, this isn't right and we're going to fix it. It doesn't say, this isn't right, it's too much. It says, this isn't right and we have to work together to find ways. And that's, that's all I can say in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the uh, emotional response that at least I try to take. Actually, I think find it really fascinating too that, uh, I mean, insofar as uh, you know, anti-status and the New World Order conspiracists have always you know pinpointed like the United Nations would be the the sort of the one world government that would affect uh, you know the sovereignty of the United States and such when all at the same time promoting some forms or all forms of uh, you know, capitalism in any sense and that the ultimate irony now is that the mated state, which as John pointed out, uh, would also include the you know armed um, enforcement eventually became becomes a multinational corporation and that obviously has to be resisted at some point. Yeah. Um, a point I forgot to make earlier came up when we were talking about um, uh, rights and ways to uh, protect things. Uh, it, it's very important to point out this incredibly world historical thing that Evo Morales did when he called for rights of the earth. That is huge, and it's one of the ways of turning this thing around in some way, in some tangible way. Um, if we can get earth rights all over the world, we could do something to make the legal system respond in ways that it's just not anymore. Um, and that automatically gets us to the idea of individuals having rights to relate to the world. Um, Thanks so much, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, big up to the doctor. Oh, thanks. Now they the meat grinder. It's not so bad, actually. <laughs> uh, oh, it's on camera. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. You're always awesome. Somebody's